Um, hi, this is Joe Meekwick with the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society Cultivating Community Gardens Histories Project or the Community Garden Memory Project. Today's date is January 13th, 2023, and I am here on Zoom recording an interview with Stephen. Machi Mach Mach Yes. <laughs> Not an easy name. Machi <laughs> Yes. I don't for a second there. Um, but um, yeah, Matt, Matt Chayefsky. Cool. Um, yeah. found, and you're the founding member of Fitzwater 2000 Community Garden. Um, and tw you're also a 25 year running Philadelphia Flower Show exhibitor. La last year was your 25th um, in 2022. So, Stephen, I want to ask you all about both of those things, obviously, especially Community Garden. But first, I'd like to get some more background information on you. That's OK. Um, sure. So where did you grow up or did you or your neighbors have gardens there? Uh, I want to thank you, first of all, for inviting me to uh, share information about our wonderful Fitzwater 2000 community garden. And uh, so where I grew up, I grew up at, in North Philly at 3rd and Erie, uh, right intersection between Erie Avenue and Sedgley Avenue. Um, it's kind of industrial, but uh, a nice several blocks. And we had a uh, like a 75 foot backyard. And then there were some rolling hills, railroad tracks behind that. So, and my, my parents are Polish and uh, my dad was a farmer in Poland. And so we always had a garden and uh, I started very young. Uh, we also had like mockingbirds and that was in the 50s. And, you know, mockingbird is considered a southern bird, but even in the 50s, they were starting to migrate north. So I would put out raisins for it in the wintertime. And they they nested uh, near the my backyard. And uh, so I, and I had, this is back then, we had the Evening Bulletin and the Philadelphia Inquirer. So I was kind of, ambitious kid so I had two paper routes and I used that money to go to Sears on the boulevard to go to their garden center to get plant material for my garden. So you delivered newspapers um, and then use that and then you use your spare change from that to uh, invest in the garden. So your first memories of gardening are intimately connected with this childhood um, where your father um, with your own self-investment in the garden. And also it seems like with um, that, with a little bit of uh, nascent naturalism, right? And with the mockingbirds. Um, so it's your father then who taught you how to garden first. Yeah, I, growing up, I heard all these great stories from the farm in Poland and what they grew. And we had a, I guess the the yard was about 25 feet wide and 75 feet long. And we had a vegetable garden. We had a little lawn. And I, I had these, edged it with uh, pink and white petunias. So uh, I just kind of filled that in and yeah, I, I remember, you know, growing beans and pumpkins in the garden and uh, beets. And, you know, everyone had a backyard and we knew all the neighbors. Uh, and I, I remember uh, Mrs. Uh, Petrosini down the street grew these great pumpkins and would pick the flowers and uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, saute them. And uh, they were really wonderful. So we had a lot of interesting neighbors and, and good cooks. And so, so you would, it was your father, but it was also kind of a, it was also kind of a village. Um, yeah, gave it, you garden experience. It, it, it was. We, we had Roy Jensen a couple of houses away, and he had a two story pigeon coop in the backyard, and he used to uh, raise his pigeons, his homing pigeons. And uh, so all, all the excess from the pigeons were distributed around the neighborhood. So everyone had rich soil. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I remember as a kid visiting other people's gardens, and uh, funny, my sister, a couple years older than me, uh, telling me that she would sneak into some gardens and 
cut their flowers and then go around house to house trying to sell flowers. And even the people she cut their flowers, they, they gave her a little money for the flowers. So it was, it was a wonderful experience growing up in that neighborhood. Yeah, it sounds like a really generous community space. Uh, but now I want to jump forward a bit, a, a couple of decades, I think, um, to when you started building um, the community space that we're here to talk about, Fitzwater 2000. Um, so I understand your history with the lot, um, well, the land itself, Fitzwater 2000, goes back to the early 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, that's correct. Um, you, that was around when you, not long after you moved to the neighborhood with your friend, Michael Laferno. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, who also founded the garden, right? So when you yeah. first came to that lot, that is land that is currently Fitzwater 2000, what did you see? Well, it, it was, a it was fenced in with a cyclone fence and, uh, it was like a overgrown, like any kind of weed lot and uh but you know i i before we tackled that i i purchased my house in 1983 i bought a i i went to school in, in europe and lived there for a few years and then i wanted to come back and my dream was to get a house like in or by center city with a garden to have the ideal life so i i bought a few properties just to kind of get a house but they had tiny gardens and then i saw this house for sale and on our block the 2000 block of Fitzwater, the, the all the lots are 102 feet deep i mean that's a really small garden but in an urban area it's a big space so i i got that and then michael bought the shell next door and then we kind of got to know the neighbors and we, we had many problems on the block I, I worked for the city as a social worker i i wanted i liked walking to work but uh we had trouble parking there were so many abandoned cars on the block and uh lots of graffiti and it, it wasn't really a desirable neighborhood and uh and there were lots of cats so many cats so all the neighbors got together and we formed a committee and and then we eventually uh dealt with uh, creating the, the community garden but you know like with cats you know we all we're all cat lovers we all have cats in our houses we keep them in the houses but you know you, uh they're not good for you know the bird population so we had all the cats fixed and let them out and usually if you have if you leave one cat on your property leave a female you, you won't she can have her boyfriends, but she won't have any more babies because it's a real time-consuming effort to help raise the kittens and then get homes for them. So the garden kind of brought all these strangers on the block together, and we focused on you know what we could do to save this open space, and then we also tackled many other problems. But the the garden was the unifying factor that brought us and has held us together for, I think we're around our 28th year now. So that's, that's almost as, I mean, that's just slightly older than your flower show tenure. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. Well, um, you know, when the, I met Michael Laferno, uh, he entered the, harvest show and i was reluctant to do that uh i i was i was not good with botanical latin at that time it really kind of scared me and uh, i said yeah i'll go but you you handle all the the latin names and uh so we entered some things and more things and more things and it became a big part of our life and then when we got the fitzwater 2000 community garden we got everyone there to start entering uh their produce and and plants at, at the harvest show and you know I, everyone talks about the harvest show everyone loved that event uh anyone could enter it it was very democratic you know you can grow a tomato on your on your porch and you know enter the enter the vegetables so um and 
I guess it went to 2002. Yes, that we have we have a record at PHS of that, um, and it came up when um, I was looking at your record for um, the flower show. So um, it's definitely all there. It was a good starting point for the the flower show too, because you just learned something about competing with fruits and vegetables and plants, and then you know everyone's kind of scared of entering the Philly flower show. And uh, all the volunteers at the Harvest Show were always so supportive, so encouraging, and many years kept on telling me to enter, to enter, and, and finally in 97, I started entering the, the Philly Flower Show. Yes, I do want to ask more about that too, um, but I wanted to first get back to the process that you and the neighborhood put together to revitalize the law, right? So what did the, um, what did the, like, what, how did you and Michael and the rest of the neighborhood committee, how did you set about improving the lot first to turn it into a garden? Well, we, we first contacted PHS and uh, we got involved in, with them and we all had to take a class about community gardens, a series of classes. And then we contacted the owner uh, who, at one point was a member of PHS, a volunteer, and he gave us permission to use it. And uh, so, and then eventually we got a, uh, like a $2,000 grant from PHS for supplies, you know, like wood to build the raised beds and uh, uh, for, for some trees and shrubs. We had to have a tree cut down and uh, build a shed. Um, and bring in some topsoil. So it sounded like a lot of money. We thought we were rich when we got this grant, but it was eaten up like immediately. So, uh, and so, and we spent endless time digging out all the debris. So, so much brick, so, uh, so many building materials left in the ground that we dug out and, uh, and lots of glass, um, like, I think one wall people used, they would just throw all their bottles on to smack it against the wall. And so we had like three inches of glass mulch that we, we're still trying to get rid of. So to add to kind of the like um, picture of the garden as it was at the time, you had these cars parked all along the street, um, graffitiing and anybody from parking, you had a lot of weeds, a lot of graffiti. Um, and on top of that, you had a, a wall length filled with broken glass. Uh, so definitely, definitely room for improvement. It sounds like that's exactly what you did um, with the topsoil and raised beds, et cetera. We, we, we did take out truckloads and I had a little truck at that time. I mean, many, many truckloads of debris. But we, we saved all the, the like decent bricks, whole bricks and half bricks. And, and we uh, kind of outlined, Michael Laferno is a landscape architect and he came up with a beautiful design. And uh, so when you first enter the garden, there's a huge circle and it's outlined with bricks. And then we have a lot of like curves. It, it opens up into another big circle and there's a smaller circle, which is our butterfly garden. And then it moves on to the shed on the right, compost on the right. And then at the middle on the left, we have uh, like eight raised beds. It, it was a, we were expanding. There was a abandoned shell next door and we were trying to get it. And uh, no one could find the owner. And uh, that leads into a, a pro issue we can talk about. So, some guy, um uh, said he was looking to buy a house and he came to some of our meetings and he said he wouldn't challenge us uh he would find some other property and lo and behold he somehow found the owner i think there was some corruption going on because at this point we we're working with anna Berner's office and they couldn't find the owner and they were trying to help us to acquire it and so we could expand our, our garden our garden now is like uh, 32 by 102 
So we wanted to make it like 48 by 102. And we are using the back of the garden. So he somehow not only purchased that property, but purchased half of our garden. And we were about to lose our garden in uh, 2004. And we were really upset because in 2001 and two, um, they had attacked the, the 2100 Fitzwater Street Community Garden. And uh, uh, Anna Verna tried to intercede and help with that. There were three lots together and uh, the developer had the middle lot. So they wanted to switch lots and they wouldn't do it. And they just came out one day with a backhoe and just were pulling out everything. And uh, uh, Michael Laferno, uh went over there with some of his workers, composite landscape company and uh, salvaged many of the, of the plants. It, it, it made a, it made it, it made the inquire. So in many ways, the story of Fitzwater 2000 is also kind of, you know, it, you're, it's a, you had, you had luck on your, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, fate, it wasn't, it didn't just, what I'm trying to say, it, was, it wasn't determined exactly that you would still have the garden all these years later, um, but that plenty of, but that you're kind of pointing to that how other, many other gardens unfortunately suffered different fates, um, not because people had no interest in them, but because of development. Mm -hmm. There, there is, at that time, there's really little interest in development in our neighborhood. Um, I, I bought here in 83, and uh, I, I like the neighborhood. I like the location. I like having the space. It seemed ideal. I don't know why there were abandoned homes here, but uh, for whatever reasons, there were. But uh, eventually, it had become a popular neighborhood. One of the good things, you know, we worked with PHS and um, uh, Terry Mashovic Neighborhood uh, Gardens Association, and we we had started the process of trying to acquire the property uh, a couple years before this serious problem. So we had really good relationships with uh, council people and politicians, and uh, one one of the things I, I did, uh, I. I I kind of, I'm the librarian for the group, and whenever we did anything uh, and we published it, or there's an article about us or pictures, I saved it, and I put together like a two-inch scrapbook of the history of our garden, and so whenever we would meet any politicians, I made several copies. It took hours and hours. I must have made about eight copies, and I would leave it with them. I don't know if they would look at it much, but I thought, if they had a hard copy, this is before like the internet and all like that, they could look at it and see what, what we had been doing. It wasn't just talk, it was action. So I thought that helped us along. Right, because you were, you were mentioning Anna Verda and she was a city council member at the time, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so you kind of had this alliance of um, Terry Mashovic being uh, someone from the Neighborhood Gardens Association, it was then at the time, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, what is today known as the Neighborhood Gardens Trust. Yeah. Um, and people from PHS and Anna Verna, and all, of course, kind of supporting just a committee of people from your neighborhood. Um, I guess. Well, two. Well, one thing I want to quickly clarify: you mentioned you used the word "shell" a couple of times, um, and I'm guessing that in this context you're referring to, like, you know, a lot in the city. Um, but I'm not. But could you clarify what you mean by the word "shell"? Well, our garden. It, there are two abandoned. There are two like lots, weeded lots at. Uh, 22 and 24. And at 2040, there was a shell of a building. Uh, it had been like it's all open. 
uh, it was not even fenced in in the back. And so we were trying to uh, get it knocked down so we could have just expand our garden. When this guy, uh, Drexler, finally got ownership of it, he did uh, have it knocked down and rebuilt the, the stonework. Um, and he, you know, he he somehow purchased other parts of our garden. And, and luckily, the, the city and thankfully to Anna Verna, uh, the city um, said, hey, wait a minute, you're not taking it over. And uh, and he was in noncompliance in some ways with l &I. So they negotiated that uh, the city would acquire the properties from him, which was part of our garden. And that he would have the property 2040 from Fitzwater Street to the back street, Climber Street. So um, it was really fortunate uh, that the city was there and and you know put the money out to do that. And and maybe because we had good relationships, you know, with with a lot of people, and and like it does take a you know a, a village like. Dennis Cowie of the Philadelphia Inquirer wrote articles about it, and Lydia, Lydia, Libya Goldstein of a South Philly Review uh, used to do a column, Urban Gardeners, and she she was right about us like a couple times a year because we would enter the city garden contest and the harvest show, and we would have you know uh, spring and fall events at our garden. PHS helped us out. We would not have been able to do it without PHS. So I feel very responsible that we have to give back. And so every year, uh, and you know, sometimes we all get busy, it's hard to do it, but every year I make sure that our garden enters the city garden contest and and contribute, you know, entered the harvest show. And uh that when they're tours, we we're on tours and we open our we would have garden tours and you know, a flea market and plant sales twice a year. So I, I think all that, you know, one hand washes the other. So they were really good to us. And I wanted to thank them uh, by always participating in these events. Yeah, thank you for that information. Um, there's so much I want to pull on and ask further about there. But I think before I ask more about, you know, um garden contests and stuff that you do in the garden um, on a yearly basis and other traditions i want to ask a little bit more about the specific roles you play you have played and continue to play for fitzwater 2000 right you mentioned um well you mentioned that you at with michael and with everybody else kind of came up with the idea of what to do with the lot um and you've also mentioned the scrapbook and being a librarian for the garden. Uh, what are your, what are the roles that you fulfill to help keep the garden going? I uh, I kind of had my self-appointed like liaison person with PHS, and so that that meant that you know helping to organize people to uh participate in, in the city garden contest and the harvest show and and attend whatever meetings were coming up and you know i i love the city garden contest but you know sometimes people are away and uh the, you have to whip the garden into shape so people you know i know there are different styles of governing and we we kind of uh we move on like quaker style consensus but then sometimes we have an autocrat and like sometimes when, you know, I, I would had a rule pass that, you know, you have to get your garden ready uh, for judging. And uh, if you can't, then uh, we'll appoint someone to do it, which would be me. So, uh, so it's, I mean, so we had a sometimes autocrat who, but an auto, a, a good person who did, you'd have to do the work. So, you know, it's hard to manage, you know, like sometimes managing gardeners, like managing cats, hard to get everything done and, you know, are people around. So people were willing to sign off on that, you know, 
most people, you know, did the work, got their plots into shape. Uh, but at the end, I would, you know, go through, spend a couple days and making sure everything looked good. Because I've also been a judge in a city garden test, and I know what judge, judges look for. And uh, so you, you want the place looking neat and clean, which is, and, and like weed free. That's, you know, you get a lot of points for that. So I, I made sure that happened all the time. And, you know, trying to motivate people, sending out emails, reminding them, like, again, and getting closer, getting closer. Final judgment is tomorrow, you know, get that garden ready. And, uh, and, and doing the same thing, you know, for the harvest show. You know, either telling people for the city garden contest, don't pick anything, leave it there. You know, the judges have to see what we're producing. And then, you know, getting people, everyone would, would contribute. Someone would like get the ice or make a drink or make cookies and uh, pot up some plants to give to the judges. I, you know, we have a passiflora incarnata, passion flower vine, and it's it comes up all over the place. It can be invasive in a suburban garden, but in an urban garden, it's easy to manage. You can pull it out. I've given away hundreds and hundreds of plants, and it's a native plant, beautiful flower. So, uh, um, so you know, everyone, um, you know, sometimes you have to nag people, but you get everyone to involve, and and people you know, thought it was really neat to contribute editor produce at the harvest show. And, and, you know, then when we would win, we, I think almost every year we won first one year, I don't know why we got second place, but uh, so we would get like some free tickets to the flower show. So we would give them out to people in the garden. So get them involved in, in the Philly flower show. Okay. Um, I, wow, there's a, there's a couple things I want to ask about, but I guess first is, um, at what point, um, at what point did you get the passive Florian Carnata? Um, cause you mentioned that you've had it for a while now. Um, and I know it's not exactly the most common plant, but as given that it's native, as you said, to the region. I think it would be interest. I, I I guess I this is partly a self indulgent question because I like the plant, but uh, <laughs> but I also think it might be interesting for others to hear about you know the story of one native plant that poses some unique challenges, but also that clearly has poses some very potent rewards. So I guess maybe in the early nineties I found out about this plant and you know I like using natives I, I'm interested in you know a lot a lot of uh, people grow plants move through different families and uh, uh, you know I've, I've gone through cacti and succulents gisneriads begonias and uh, for like indoor plants and people do the same with their outdoor plants so I was surprised that we had uh, th this like mainly a tropical plant growing this far north. And uh, I found it for sale. And I think I paid like 20 or $25 for this one little plant. And this was like in the 90s, which was considered a lot of money for this plant. And uh, it, it grew vigorously at times. It loves the heat. Uh, one time I had it in my garden. It didn't come up until uh, July 1st. I thought it was really... I thought it had died, but we had a, a, a cool uh, spring and it really loves heat. And so it was just waiting for it to get warm. I, uh, I gave a couple to my dad and by this time they had moved from Philly to uh, Warminster and he had it growing by his porch. And I was up there, I, I, one summer I picked 400 fruits from like these two plants. Uh, it was a really, really hot summer. And uh, I always tell people uh, it has a taste of like a juicy fruit and it does not, it's mostly like, it's like big as an egg, a green egg, mostly hollow. And there's about a teaspoon of, of a gelatinous material with black seeds. 
So I said, it's not the thing to eat on your first date. You open it up, you kind of suck it out and then spit the seeds out. And, uh, but it's a wonderful taste. And uh, so I, uh, I had it in my garden. I put it in the community garden and it grows quite easily. It comes up everywhere. Just dig it up, put it in the pot and have another plant to give away. And I, I've given a lot to like uh, the, the plant dividend at, at PHS. So you, yeah. do, you if, do you have it? No, I don't, but I... Uh, I'll give you one or oh, many. <laughs> oh, I, I would, I would, I would appreciate that. I just don't know that I have the room to grow it right now in my current apartment, but hopefully soon enough, I will figure out a long-term outdoor solution because I'd like to do more outdoor gardening. I just, I foraged it a lot and I agree. There's nothing really like the fruit, um, but um, I wanted to, but I think that that's a good segue though, from talking about, you know, this really unique purple pa passion flower plant um, to talk a little bit more about your background as a naturalist as well. Um, Cause you've already, yeah, you've talked a bit about feeding the mockingbirds um, I, when you were growing up and, you know, I, they just nereids um, and all, you know, your various conservation projects you co-founded the Humboldt Society of Lesbian and Gay Naturalists in 1982. Um, it's very, very cool. Um, and co-founded, and also um, going, bringing back to, you know, the international point that you brought up with the, um, with the, well, I mean, in addition to Bird Safe Philly, um, more recently, um, you also helped co-found the Gisneria Conservation Center in Guilin, China. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's a lot, <laughs> obviously, to do on top of being a social worker and on top of managing, um, you, you know, so much of this community garden stuff um, and herding cats, both literally and figuratively. Um, so how would you characterize the relationship between your naturalist work and your work in the community garden? Hmm. Um, well, I, I, I love telling stories and to people in the community garden. And I think everyone in our community garden, they're all birders. They all have bird feeders and they're, they're interested in birds say Philly. Uh, one of my neighbors just went to get his car fixed and discovered that uh, at the auto dealer, many birds are crashing into the glass. So, I mean, I think it's good to, you know, sh share your, your passion. And I mean, other people may be interested in it. So you need to talk about it. And, and uh, someone else is a, a nurse at a, a college and there's a lot of birds crashing in in the college windows so and we take all of our dead birds to the uh, academy of natural sciences um so and I, I i guess i started in 2008 doing the bird monitoring in center city and did that for a few years and then uh stopped it for a while i got very interested in plants and international travel um going going to asia primarily in china and and that came about i mean a lot of things by chance i had been to ecuador on a birding trip and in a gisneriad hunting trip and i wrote a good article that people liked about it and a, a professor from china who's the the authority on gisneriads of china read it and said and he he was in philly for a day and i was his tour guide and he said, oh, you should come to China and you can write a better article. I I hadn't thought of going to China before. So I went and uh, he, for two weeks, and he's an expert. He knows all the rare plants. He, he took me around to see all these rare, really rare plants. Now, I know when, when the population of animals gets to be low, they count the individual. I didn't know they did that with plants. So he would take me to an area and say, there's 50 of this species or some, another place there's 100 or 250, but that's it. 
when they're gone, they're gone from the planet forever. And so I felt fortunate that I was able to see these plants, but I, I came back feeling sad that they, I could be the only last person to see them. And uh, so I talked about it and uh, wrote a story, did a slideshow, went around traveling with it. And I got the Gisneriad Society to uh, fund a program there. And that was the, the birth of the world's first center to save Gisneriads from extinction. We now have five centers in China and we're about to open one in Vietnam. So uh, good luck. So we've had good luck with that. Yeah, I think that for most people who uh, most people in the US probably aren't as familiar with Gisneriads as an endangered family, but rather from just the ornamental ones. Um, because that's the only one, those are the only ones I've I've known before. But hearing about this, I think, um, is interesting. And it and it clearly I think ties into um the uh, you know, it fits together with gardening and obviously horticulture. Um and it's and it's definitely important work. Um so thank you for sharing that with me. Um you know, a lot of people say, oh, they don't know any Gisneriads. And I said, e everyone knows Gisneriads. And they look at me like, what? And, you know, the African violet is a Gisneriad. And that is the most popular plant on the planet. I don't know why. But we're interested in like all the other ones in the family. And there's like over 2,500 different species. Right. Right. Um, plant, yeah. Plant families. Are, are amazing um but um i wanted to though talk a little bit more about your horticultural adventures now as well um so i understand that you, you mentioned that you know fitzwater 2000 has been and also your own personal gardens have both been great cultivating spaces for your exhibitions of the flower show um for which again you've been going for, um, you're now in your third decade of going to the show. Um, and your horticultural credentials include that you're president of the Liberty Bell Gisneriad Society. That's mm -hmm. correct. Um, and also the Delaware Valley branch of the Begonia Society. Um, and you've received a PHS Medal of Achievement. Um, and also, I would, uh, Speaking of first place ribbons, um, you've won uh, you've won a first place ribbon. I think usually multiple at every show since two thousand four. Um, so how do you get started at the nineteen ninety seven flower show? Well, from it, it, uh, I mean these are stepping stones. So I'm involved in the community garden and and with Michael. He, he like you know, going to the harvest show. And, you know, I, I started entering plants there and they were very encouraging. And it was with, a, I think, a, a, a passion flower of mine was one of the first plants that I entered at the Philly Flower Show. And so I entered just a few in the first year in, in 1997. And, you know, I didn't die. It, it wasn't that scary to do it. A lot of people are very afraid of entering their plants feel that people be critical or something but it, it's really quite easy and everyone is so supportive and helpful so i started small and you know over the years you know this will be the 26th year coming up so i, I now i need like many people to help me sometimes i you know there are three different judgings so i enter like near 200 plants and it just gets to be a, a colossal effort and so like, I and I, I grow a lot of Amorphophallus conjac. They're those plants that flower in the springtime from the tuber. And uh, they create a, an amazing stench. And so, but it's, it's playing with timing. Like I know people would have like three greenhouses, like regular temperature and a hot house and a cool house. So you can move it if it's early or late. I don't have that. I just grow in my house under lights or by the window. 
So uh, I have a number of tubers. Hopefully, you know, one or two will be in flower for the show. Um, I think in 19, I, I must have had about nine of them. They're, for some reason, they're all in sync and they're all flowering. And uh, so that was kind of neat. So and I so I grow, they take up some space. So I put them in a big pot, and I have some uh, in the community garden, and you know ma many in in the garden behind my house. And Michael lives next door in, in his house. So uh, yeah, I mean, growing in your own backyard, entering the harvest show, and then the flower show. I, I always tell people the harvest show was like the midterms. You know, if you only have one exam a year, you can fall behind and get lazy and, you know, put things off. But when you, you had to kind of review all of your plants at the harvest show and so got them looking good. So then you can move on, have them ready for the show in March. Yeah, you kind of had that was kind of your entry point and also kind of your. uh your yeah your midterm your do if you if you don't pass this then do not pass go and do not collect two hundred dollars um to use another Philly analogy of monopoly um but I wanted to ask uh, at this point though um you've talked a lot about how your own you've talked a bit about how your own process of you know growing the plants um has developed over time how has the show changed since you first started exhibiting uh, back in 1997. Well, it's it's improved. Uh, the the new Hort Court is really spectacular stage to show off your plants. So and 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 you know and the past two years it's been held in the summertime because of COVID, but this year um, the Hort Court is going to be the centerpiece of of the Philly Flower Show. So that they're giving us even more attention. Uh, people, people seem to like seeing these plants and, you know, some of the plants, same plant every year, more mature or a little different all, but, uh, they all have a history and I kind of have a following people like to, like to see these plants come back year after year. And it's always a challenge, you know, things get older, some don't make it. So you always have to, you know, acquire, uh, new plants and, it's great working with PHS, trying to come up with new categories. Uh, I, I remember uh, th there was a category like for vining plants or trained vines. Uh, you can put a Hoya in that. But Hoyas never did well competing against other plants. So like I would, I would ask every year I send a, a letter to PHS kind of a re review uh of the wonderful job they're doing at the philly flower show and with some suggestions and always trying to create new classes and so i would say why don't you have a class for hoyas and uh they finally did and it's great to see all these hoyas competing against each other so and i've, I've done that with many other categories like the the climbing onion uh, uh volubilis uh right on my uh on my other side um that that will be in in the harvest in the uh, flower show and that used to be i think one day and now it's like on every day and then a pot under six inches and a pot uh over six inches so uh, there, there are just many many more categories in the show there, there's a category like for everyone to enter a plant so and even like for philodendron and a lot of people grow philodendron i mean you don't need a rare or expensive plant you can any any plant a common plant you grow it well have it present it well and you know you could win and it's not and it's not just winning i i always tell people the idea even even if you don't win so what you the the what you should what you think about is participating and you know, so even if you don't win a ribbon, your plant will make the blue ribbon winner look better. Uh, so the idea is just to, you know, be a part of it. And it's a great tradition. I love in the book, uh, like a thousand things you must do before you die. And they mention they mention going to the Philadelphia Flower Show. Well, that's great, but it's even better when you participate. Right. 
is it you you get the opportunity to invest a bit more and build a relationship with the plant and then get your plant out there um so other people can also appreciate it and see what other yeah I mean, it's it's all connected. My parents took me there as a kid, and I didn't know what it would lead to. And like now, I've been going there for you know twenty six years. And I, uh, you know, when I went there and I admired and kind of uh, wanted all these plants I saw. And so I think it's good that you know I now bring plants that other people could see. Uh, there's this one one guy. Uh, uh, Brandon Huber, uh, Mr. Morphophallus, he's he's entered a lot of those. He's really made them popular at the Philly Flower Show. I think I met him when he was 14, and I gave him his first Gisneriad. And uh, he, so he was in high school. He wasn't happy with it. He wasn't going to go to college. Well, he just got his PhD uh, in, in uh, horticulture. So it's good that we all can, you know, contribute and help each other grow and, you know, learn. Yeah, you literally helped him grow, it sounds like, given that he's now growing a morphophallus as well. But um, uh, I want to thank you for sharing that. Uh, I think that that's, a, it's good to get someone else, someone's perspective on the show um, for for these interviews who comes at it from you know the perspective of someone who was harvest show first then show and now making suggestions for it as well um but in develop in helping to develop new categories um but yeah i wanted to ask though i want to return to the topic of fitzwater 2000 um because you also mentioned that the show and you know getting people into the show has been a big part of uh and of horticultural exhibition in general has been a big part of your um your role in the community garden right and i wanted to uh ask you if you could walk me through a year um in fitzwater um looking at the traditions of you know you mentioned tours and the city garden contest and you've also mentioned spring and uh i think spring and fall sales and also halloween previously um so what traditions like those um and any others that you can think of characterize garden work and recreation for you well our our, our garden is really a year-round garden uh we we have these uh winter king hawthorn trees that are uh there was a phs gold metal plant and we put them in and they're covered with fruits and i i always go out there when it especially when it snows to get photographs of the snow covered berries if they're still there because at other times the rob flocks of robins will come in and and eat the fruits so uh, the, i i always look forward to that time of year and hoping you know everything lines up that there are enough berries there and the robins are there and the snow is there so uh, that, that's a good part and you know and in springtime is clean up and you know some some people start really early when it's cold and uh, gr growing things and other people you know start later uh, and you know we go we have some early meetings and you know collecting dues and asking people you know if they want their plot you know we have a demand for plots we we don't really have enough we have like uh, eight plots and we have 12 people managing them and you now we uh people can join the garden i think it's maybe ten dollars and uh five dollars like to get a key and so you could just enjoy the garden and you can work on the common areas. You know, having a garden, there's always work to be done, always cleaning up and weeding and all. So uh, we, and some people just want to do that. They don't really want to manage a plot, just want to go there and enjoy that. And so, you know, it's been different in the past two years because I think uh, well, the past year we didn't have a city garden contest. 
And the year before that, we had it done by photographs. So uh, luckily, I take a lot of pictures and I could send them in. And then they evaluated the garden that way. Um, and and you know, then we have talk about watering schedules. Uh, uh, maybe you get a good week. You don't. We get some rain. You don't have to water, but other times it's really parched. And so we we have a number of barrels in our garden, and we collect the rainwater from the the roof next door. And uh, we even have like fencing in the barrels because we don't want a cat falling in there or an animal not being able to get out. And uh, we have the mosquito dunks and. And it's it's interesting in the uh, the warm weather we have lightning bugs in our garden and you know you don't see that many lightning bugs right downtown and like we're like two blocks below South Street and we all we've noticed that we have bats and nighthawks flying over our garden uh, so we, I don't it's a small space you know but we I guess it generates enough insects there that the bats and nighthawks fly around. Uh, getting a, a free lunch, which is you know what we want to do, um, and unfortunately we don't have the harvest show, and uh, so we don't do that in the full time. But in in the springtime we have a we we get the no parking signs on our block, and we try to keep it clear so people can pull over, and we set up a lot of tables like flea market stuff that people can sell, and. Uh, we usually get a number of plants to sell for our neighbors and, and like giveaways. And we have tours of our garden. Um, so we do that in springtime and in, in the fall. Um, and what else? So, you know, usually we win and we get some tickets and we, you know, figure out who hasn't gone to the show. So we give out the tickets to people so they can go and visit the, the flower show. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, it took many, many people helping us to get where we were and, uh, um, you know, uh, state, uh, representative Babette Josephs, um, uh, around maybe 2005 or something, got us a grant for $5,000. And it was the year that the city decided that we could no longer get water from the hydrant. So we had to bring in water service. And guess what water service cost to put in? $5,000. And then our garden, we had a cyclone fence around it. We had broken sidewalks. And uh, so if we were going to become a, you know, a part of the uh, neighborhood garden trust, we'd have to fix up the sidewalks and all. And, and luckily, sta uh, State Senator Vincent Fumo got us a, a sizable grant, like $25,000. And uh, we had to take down a large tree. We had to, uh, we had a black metal fence put in all the way around the garden. And we had four sidewalks, you know, two on Fitzwater Street and two on Climber Street. And uh, I remember we had a, a, a sidewalk, a, uh, what, what do we call it? Sidewalk drying party. Um, they, the guys did the work and we had about 20 minutes before they finished and we would get there to make sure no one would write in it. In that 20 minutes, someone wrote in the sidewalk, but luckily it was wet enough that we could smooth it out. So then we, we got together with some beer and wine and we, we sat there for hours until it dried. Uh, but, uh, you know, and once we had the sidewalks and the metal fencing, it was amazing. People would come up to us and start talking to us about the new garden on the block. It wasn't new, it just was framed with a black fence and now it became real for some reason for some people. So we're really lucky to, uh, to have that. That's a great story, thank you. Uh, I, as someone who's ridden in drying concrete before, I understand, I, I mean, yeah, I understand that you might, why it might be a good idea to hang around for a few hours um <laughs> to prevent fellow other uh, graffiti artists um but so i guess that kind of gets into the next question i wanted to ask which is how has the garden changed i mean since, since you um 
since it's been 28 years, give or take, right? Since the garden got off the ground as a garden. Um, how has the garden changed since then? You've just mentioned, obviously, um, the, you know, these huge renovation projects um, and switching from city water to, well, switching from, sorry, the hydrant water to a water service. Um, how is the, but yeah, what, how would you characterize the garden development on the whole? We have a, Michael Laferno did a very good design and we're comfortable with it and it lends itself to some change within that design, but uh, there's some like structure in there. Um, uh, like the, the Hawthorns, you know, they're there, they, they frame part of the circle. And uh, we have these um, uh, elderberry, uh, well, there were bushes, small bushes, Steve Maurer, who used to work for PHS and lives a couple blocks away, had them in his garden and they weren't doing well. And he, he said, do you want them? And uh, I said, sure. And uh, well, they're like maybe 20 feet high now. And, uh, and there is wonderful black color leaves and they have all this uh, beautiful flowers, whitish, pinkish flowers and this fruit that the birds love. And uh, so they feel, we didn't really plan on that. I didn't expect them to get that big, but they're huge. And uh, so that, that has changed uh, part of the garden. Um, and we, we have an area in, in the back, kind of an, an herb garden, and we have a lot of milkweed plants. Um, we, we have a sign that our garden is, by National Wildlife Federation, it's a wildlife uh, habitat and also a monarch stopover. We have a lot of milkweed for, for them. It was interesting. Uh, so I, I was at John Hines Wildlife Refuge and they have a lot of milkweed there and I was birding there and the, uh, the plants had a, a bug. Uh, they not only had the milkweed caterpillar, but they had a, an insect called the milkweed bug. And it's like a looks like a black beetle with a uh, like a orangey red shield on the back. It's really dramatic looking. And I thought, oh, how come we don't have them in our garden? Well, next year somehow they found our garden, and so it's great to uh, you know create this habitat for for pollinators and and different insects. Um, we added a couple arborvitae in front of our garden that were small when we put them in and now they're like 15 feet tall and uh, and uh, so we have this big open area uh, in our garden so our garden is like combination uh, sitting garden uh, butterfly garden and and plots but we have this big circle in the front wood chip area outlined in brick and and sometimes i create a design i get perilla um, and it's like a dark maroon leaf Japanese steak plant. And so I'll put, I don't know, a uh, hundred of them together. And they, they can, at, by the end of the season, they're like three feet tall. And it's a beautiful maroon circle within a circle. And uh, uh, so, and then uh, maybe uh, we had some detour flowers in the back. And, you know, they peak at once. And and so I collected like 200 flowers. They only last a day. And then I made this big circle within the circle, kind of uh, artistic use of, of the circle. Only good for a few days, but it was pretty dramatic looking. So uh, we're, we're able to stage things like that in, in this uh, center, the entrance to our garden. And then we have a large flower pot. Uh, so we have a, a small gate, like three feet tall, and then a brick area, and then a larger gate uh, to get into the garden. And then the smaller brick area, we have this huge flower pot, and we has like a you know, changing displays. Uh, we we every year we put different things in it. Uh, so some of the interesting plants. Uh, I always like to use 
pokeweed in the garden. It's a weed, and you know, some people we have some discussions in our garden. You know, it's like it's like working at the UN. Everyone doesn't agree on what's a good plant, and uh, but I love that plant. It's one of my favorite plants. And uh, you know, when I, I after college, I I was or I was studying final year in college, and then I got a job and lived in Europe for a few years. And some gardeners came back from the states, and I asked, "What was your favorite plant?" And they said, "Pokeweed." And I, I couldn't believe they said that. I, I said, it's a weed. Well, it's a really beautiful weed. It's such rich coloration in, in the berries, the raspberry stems, the kind of purplish colored fruit. And it's like green before. So it, it has become one of my favorite plants. And it's good for birds. So I always make sure there are a couple of them in our garden. We have uh, hops growing. We had some people making beer. Um, uh, so it's good to to grow the hops, and I, you know I mentioned the Passiflora incarnata. I put in a, a cross vine. It's a wonderful native vine and had fantastic flowers. Um, kind of a, a pinkish uh, part of it is kind of a pinkish, and then the other part is gold and quite large, very dramatic looking flowers. So. Uh, I enjoy. So, you know, we, it's a small garden, so there's a limited amount of things that you can grow, but we, we get a, a variety of things uh, in there. Small garden, but you have a lot of color. Yeah. 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 Well, on that note, I guess uh, I would want to wrap things up a little bit with more of a reflective question um, about, uh, you know, where the garden is, you talked a bit about where the garden is now and how it came to be um, from, you know, the la last two decades of the 20th century in the neighborhood committee to ongoing preservation efforts and uh, renovation efforts in the 21st century to now where you are with these 20 foot tall elderberry bushes um and the and the, you know and the winter king hawthorns etc and of course plenty of participation in the flower show among the gardeners and plenty of interest as well in related naturalist pursuits um like bird safe philly right um i want to ask at this point though from your yeah again looking at this from your perspective what are your future plans and hopes um, for Fitzwater 2000 um, as a garden. I hope we can just continue. Um, I, I think we will, you know, maintain the interest. Some people are, you know, more interested than others, and but there's a high level of interest in the garden. And, you know, we have a waiting list of people who would like to join. Um, I remember uh, 20 years ago, um, the city did a, a project called like Art in the Garden with PHS. And so they assigned different artists to different gardens. And we got Charlotte Elsner and she's a graphic artist. And she would come over and spend time working in the garden and sharing her gardening techniques. And she, you know, she taught me about pruning butterfly bush. We, we have that in our butterfly garden. Uh, and, uh, and she made these beautiful scrolls that were exhibited at City Hall, five foot long scrolls about our garden, our garden in the area and the whole area. So, I mean, as our neighborhood has developed, I couldn't really afford to buy here now. Uh, properties are so expensive. Um, and our, our gar and a lot of people told us uh, that they moved to our area because they thought if a neighborhood neighborhood could maintain such a nice garden it must be a good neighborhood that that people work together and you know that's that's true so uh now we've been doing it for 28 years and uh it's mature now you know um i have pictures of the garden when it was just flat completely flat and uh and now there's so much height to the garden and you know that takes time and uh Luckily, we we have time on our side now, and uh, so uh, 
it's good to work with the new people and uh you know a lot of us old heads have been doing it for years and new people come in and they're so excited they want to try new things plant new varieties of vegetables and all and they're not shy of doing the work and you know taking on projects and saying why don't we do this so i mean i feel very uh optimistic and hopeful that you know the garden will go on and on it, it's a jewel in our neighborhood um unfortunately we don't have enough of these jewels on every block and and it's permanently preserved now so uh you know, and we like turning the title over to the neighborhood uh, uh, garden trust. We did we made that decision year years ago because we said we don't know how long you know we will live here. If any of us will move, uh, if you lose interest or people get into arguments, none of that has really happened. But it's good that you know we're involved with an umbrella organization who will help to uh, manage this even when you know we're not here. So. Uh, it's a great legacy to live to leave to this to you know the the area um i'm so glad you know that we saved this and we could have easily have lost it and and i mean now it's a it would be impossible to do it today yeah yeah so you you preserved it so that the the human neighbors and the night hawks and the butterflies can all continue to enjoy it for the years to come yeah well, thank you so much. On that note, I think um, uh, it's time for uh, us to sign off. So I really appreciated interviewing you, Stephen, um, and getting to learn a bit more about your work with the um, with Fitzwater 2000 Community Garden and the Flower Show and with your naturalist uh, adventures as well. So really appreciated it. And thank you for agreeing to sit down with me today. Uh, it was my pleasure to, to do it and we should connect and I can give you some uh, passion flower plants and uh, I like to you know um, Bird Safe Philly will I hopefully be working with PHS because you know it's a good way to do outreach to outreach to a lot of people who have gardens and you know I monitor in Center City but um, you know most bird fatalities occur in people's homes it's not the high rises it's just reflective glass and you know all gardeners i think like birds and would like to make the habitat better for for birds so yeah i think it's a i think it's a fair assumption to make um but so yeah i thank you and i'm gonna turn off the recorder now